What do you do when your faith is shaken? When stuff happens in life and you have this faith, um, but there seems to be a disconnect. There's something happening that's causing you to wonder, not like whether or not God is good or whether or not he's true, but just simply that your faith is shaken a bit. As a believer, what do you do when your belief has collided with a situation that challenges you and it sets you into this place of trial? Whether it be finances or relationship or health or whatever that is, what do you do? Well, in our passage today, we're talking about, believe it or not, John the Baptist in a time when, though he was still a man of faith, his security in it, his, his uh, daily um, trust was a bit shaken, and, and it causes us to have a really, really good uh, study so that we can understand what to do when ours is shaken. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 7. We're looking at verses 18 to 35. Luke chapter 7, verses 18 to 35. And again, like I said, this is talking about John the Baptist. If you don't know where the Gospel of Luke is in the beginning of your Bible, there's a table of contents. I just want you to go ahead and use it, all right? Luke chapter 7, verse 18 to 35. Now, we're not going to read the whole thing. Um, I'm just going to read verses uh, 18 and 19. Here's what it says. The disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything Jesus was doing. So John called for two of his disciples, and he sent them to the Lord to ask him, are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for our time here, and I thank you, Lord, that you give us these encounters of people that help us understand what to do in our faith when we're having great times and when we're having difficult times. And so, Lord, as we're looking into this, uh, I pray, Jesus, that we would have eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that are open to you today. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So John the Baptist is an interesting character in the scriptures because he is the forerunner of Jesus. He is the one who uh, prophetically is supposed to prepare the way of the Lord. We understand that at Jesus' baptism, uh, John says, like, here is the Lamb of God, right? So who takes away the sins of the world? So John knew who he was, and he knew who Jesus was. And yet we find here that John is struggling. And so in our passage today, we actually find two types of doubters. There's uh, John the Baptist, for example. He's the first doubter that we encounter in this particular passage. He's been placed in Herod's prison because he did what God wanted him to do. That's the context here. John uh, was sent to be the forerunner of the Messiah. He preached what God wanted him to preach. He called everyone to repentance. He did everything God asked. He even told Herod that Herod was living outside of God's rule. He was living sinful life by being married to his brother's wife or having a relationship with his brother's wife. So John's thrown into Herod's prison for telling the truth and for saying things that needed to be said, things that nobody else was willing to say. And through it all, his faith at this point, well, it was kind of shaken. You know, that self-doubt that starts to kick in because he is as human as everyone else. So that's one type of doubter, right? The person who uh, is experiencing some pretty difficult things. And, and then you have the doubters uh, that we would look at and say, well, these are the Pharisees, these are the scribes, the teachers of the law, the lawyers. They're the skeptics of Jesus. They have faith in God, but they're relying on their own righteousness to please him. They were disbelievers when it came to John the Baptist. As a matter of fact, in our text, it tells us that they said that he had a demon and they were skeptics of Jesus, calling him a drunkard and a glutton. They were offended by John, or when John and Jesus preached repentance to them. So how does Jesus restore faith of John? That's a question that I think is important for us to answer. How does he restore the people's confidence in him at this point, many were just thinking of him as a prophet, but how does he restore the confidence of people in him? And what steps can we take when we are struggling? That's the importance of these kinds of encounters. It educates us on what to do in our own times of doubt and struggle and discouragement. And so then I, I want us to see very specifically 
what Jesus says concerning John and his doubts and what he says to the skeptical Pharisees. So Luke 7, 18 to 35. Here's verse 18 and 20, which is what we read earlier. But we have discouraged believers. John's disciples told him about all these things. And these are all the things that he, he has been doing. He just finished raising the widow's son from the dead. He was dealing with the faith of the Roman officer. And so these things were taking place. And John's disciples told him about all these things. And then calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Or keep looking for someone else. When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who has come or should we expect someone else? Now, again, to reiterate, John is in prison. He's under one of the world's most wicked tyrants in the ancient world, King Herod. And for doing the right thing. When John's faith was being tested, he went to the one place that we must go if ours are ever tested, and that is Jesus. Like, I want you to see this here. John is experiencing considerable struggle, and he likely knows that his life is forfeit. And he knows he's the forerunner of Jesus. He knows that G who Jesus is, and he's now in a space of, man, like, did I get this wrong? And so he sends messengers to Jesus because he couldn't go himself. Like his response to his doubt is to go to Jesus, not to go elsewhere, right? His response is to go to Jesus. So John's personal struggles were beginning to take a toll on his faith as he lay in Herod's castle prison wondering, thinking, and considering, is Jesus really the Messiah? Like, did he get it wrong? Even though he knows he is, he's still struggling here. So was he really the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the people? Was he the one that we should be looking for or should we find another? Most people today, when they doubt Jesus, they don't typically go to Jesus. Now, they, especially if people grow up in the church. Um, people who grow up in the church or grow up in the faith tend to assume expert status when it comes to the Christian faith. And as a result, Jesus often isn't the first resort for those who oppose but those who oppose Jesus are, right? So I grew up in the faith, so I must know everything there is to know about the faith, even though if I was asked some pretty simple questions, I probably don't know the answers. But because I grew up in the faith, I'm going to assume expert status, so I'm not going to bother studying it. I'm going to study the people who oppose the Christian faith. That's what I find to be the predominant and prevailing uh, pattern. Uh, some people would call that deconstructionism. Uh, I, I prefer the idea of if we grow up in the faith that we need to declutter things so that we get a, a, a more authentic and true perspective of what the Christian faith is. It's the idea of finding our faith for ourselves. Um, what does that personal relationship for us look like rather than just adopting the relationships or the idea of the relationship from the people around us? Like those are good. They educate us. They equip us. They disciple us. But we still need to be able to have our own relationship to Jesus. So we strip away some things um, that are patterns that maybe aren't necessarily biblical, but they're not necessarily bad. And so that's a decluttering idea. But I find that the deconstructionist is the person who assumes expert status, and instead of going to Jesus, they go to the opposition of Jesus. But you have to ask, like, where did John go when doubts began to attack his mind? When he doubted Jesus, he went to Jesus. And since he couldn't go himself, he sent two of his disciples, two messengers, to Jesus. And they asked John's question word for word. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? So what's, what's he asking? Well, he's asking, are you the Messiah that we've been waiting for or should we keep on looking? Like this is a very authentic and, and very um, vulnerable question for a man like John to be asking. So what we must understand here is that John's not a skeptic. Things weren't going the way he thought, and he was confused, and he couldn't understand what God was doing. Like, have you ever been in that space? Things not going the way you thought? Have you ever been confused and tr tried by the will of God? Not sure what the outcome is to be? Here's the real issue going on in, 
in John's thinking. Do I really believe? Do I really trust Christ with my life even when things aren't going well and I'm in a trial? John was suffering and so was his faith. And then we see that in this question, Jesus answers him. In in 21 to 23, it says, At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sickness, and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. And so Jesus answers him by showing the two messengers that, like what he's been up to, and by quoting scripture. Jesus says, I want you to see for yourselves. I want you to see for yourselves that in this space, like Jesus is healing those with diseases and plagues. He casts out evil spirits. He restores sight to the blind and many other things that are not even mentioned in this particular passage. And it seems to beg the question for me, like isn't God's timing perfect? At the very moment that John's disciples come to Jesus, Jesus was already had these people lined up who were going to be healed, who were going to be delivered, who were going to be experiencing all these good things, so that they could be eyewitnesses, not just hearing the testimony of what Jesus did, but seeing what Jesus did and becoming part of that testimony for John. They can go back to John with what they've seen and say that, yeah, he in fact is the one. And not only does Jesus show the disciples of John what he's been doing, but he does something that's outstanding. Jesus knows that John the Baptist is a Bible student. John knows the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus quotes two passages from scripture to get John thinking, his thinking back in order. And and that's often what scripture does for us, right? Like it realigns, it reorients our thinking to get back into that biblical worldview and less of us and more of Jesus. And so scripture gets our focus off of ourselves and our struggles and sets our minds on the things of God. And he quotes Isaiah 35 verse 5 and Isaiah 61 verse 1. And he says, during the reign of the Messiah, Isaiah 35 5 says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. In other words, they will begin to hear again. Isaiah 61 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to the to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for prisoners. So Jesus shows John's disciples that he is doing exactly what the Bible says the Messiah will do. He shows them and then tells them to go back and quote these verses to John. He knew that in quoting these single verses, John would understand the context, he would know what was going on and all the verses around it, and his faith would be encouraged and strong again. John would understand, as he was in prison, John would understand that he's in prison now, that the day was coming when Jesus would reign over all the earth. Even though now his reign was just in certain areas, there was a day coming when it would be global, and he took comfort in that day. And truth is, so can we. Jesus currently reigns in the hearts of believers and there's a day coming when the entire earth is referred to as being his footstool, that he he rules over it and his reign will be universal, not just local. And even in the day of John's trials, liberty was proclaimed to the captive and the prison was open for John and and his heart was set free as he began to see the King Jesus could be trusted. John can place his trust in Jesus, and we too can place our lives in the hands of Christ. Now, admittedly, did John ever get out of prison? No, John didn't get out of the physical prison. But John was released from the prison of sin into eternal life. And then we find that in verses 24 to 27, Jesus speaks about John to the crowd that was there. 
Verse 24, it says, After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. John's greatest or greatness came because he was given the task of introducing Jesus to the world. All of the prophets before John longed to see the day when their prophecies would come to pass. Only John prophesied and then lived to see it unfold in terms of those messianic prophecies. His greatness came because of his role as the forerunner, and yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And so what Jesus is saying in that particular part is that the newest, weakest Christian is greater than John the Baptist. And it's because we've experienced the finished work of Jesus. We know firsthand the things that John only dreamed of. We know the sins are forgiven and repentance is present. We know about the cross and the tomb. We know about the grave and how it could not hold Jesus. We know about the universal call to repent and believe. We know that he is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And these are things that John didn't know because he hadn't seen them yet. He hadn't experienced them. He saw the coming of Jesus and he proclaimed the coming of Jesus. But he didn't see the resurrection. He didn't see the ascension. And so, to some extent, we have it better off than John because we're able to understand these things retrospectively. And then in this, we see two responses to Jesus. And, and this is where we get back to the skeptics, right? Verses 29 to 35. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts of the law rejected God's purposes, a purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? Well, they're like children sitting in a marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say he is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. And so here are the responses that we see. Like the first response is that people heard the message of John and Jesus and declared that God was just and correct in his verdict, and they were guilty of sin and needed to repent, right? That's verse 29. All the people, even tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. And the second response that we see here is that others heard the verdict and they disagreed and they tried to justify themselves. For John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking wine, eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he is a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say that he is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And so Jesus very clearly says that these are the Pharisees and the lawyers who were doing what they always did. When John preached repentance, and faith, they said he has a demon because well, he was unsocial and he was too harsh. When Jesus came with the same message of repentance, they said he was a glutton and a drunkard and he was too social and too inclusive. They were never going to agree with God. Never. By running down Jesus and John, they were trying to show their superiority and they disagreed with God's verdict and in the end suffered the consequences. Jesus shows that there are two types of people, those who agree with God concerning their sin and those who are offended when they're told that they are sinners. And we're also shown that even the greatest prophet can have doubts when faced with serious trials. Jesus lovingly restores his faithful doubters, but severely judges the skeptical unbelievers.
One commentator said, Jesus was the savior they needed all along. He was the friend of tax collectors and sinners, but because they didn't think they were sinners, Jesus was no friend of theirs. He was John's friend. He was the tax collector's friend. He was the prostitute's friend. He was the drunkard's friend. He was the friend of gluttons. But he was not their friend. John is the example that teaches us that we can be sure of Jesus even in the midst of our struggle. That when we're dealing with difficult things, when there's a trial or, or temptations that come along and, and, and we're, we've got this anxiety that builds up within us, that our first response should be to go to Jesus to be, well, consoled. That he's more than willing to show us what we need to prove himself to be who he is in his way. So John needed to hear from his messengers the eyewitness accounts of what Jesus was doing and the scripture that they needed. And Thomas needed to touch the wounds to recognize that Jesus was in fact actually raised from the dead. Jesus regularly enters in and consoles our anxieties, our doubts, our discouragements. He is the one and we should not look for another but trust in him alone. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for today and for your word and for this opportunity that we get to be able even to look at your word. And so Lord, even as we seek to understand John's plight and we look at uh, the sinners that were in the crowd that recognize that your verdict was good, Lord, even sometimes we find ourselves likely like the Pharisees and the scribes and teachers of the law where we want to justify ourselves. I, I pray, Lord, that whether we're struggling whether we're confronted with truth and our response to that truth is to receive it or our response to that truth is to, uh, Lord, just kind of rail against it a bit. Lord, that in all of these things that, that we would consistently just seek your face. Lord, that we would not be a people who, like the Pharisees, would turn away from you, but rather, Lord, like the sinners and like John, that we would turn towards you to receive that consolation. In your name I pray, Lord. Amen.